Which which one? Right here. Hello, uh, everyone, and welcome to May the 2nd, 2023 Legislative Committee meeting. I call this meeting to order at 3.01. First up, I'll take a motion for the adoption of the agenda. Councillor Warwa makes that motion. Is there any additions or deletions to the agenda? Seeing none, all those in favor? Carried. Thank you. Next up, the adoptions of our last regular legislative meeting. Look for a motion. Okay, Council Lemko makes the motion. Any errors or omissions within those minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor? Carry. We have no delegations today, so we're going to go back to our employee policy manual, the updates that have been done, and we are going to give it to our human resource officer, Kaylee Iremcio. We'll start at 2.15, resignation of employment. Um, what has changed there? Sorry, get my mic ready. What's changed there is the notice periods, just keeping up with employment standards, and I, which it was before. Uh, but <coughs> one thing that changed that is the reason for resignation that's not required. We don't have to have that included. So I just took that out. Thoughts? Okay. Anybody? Good. Um, next section. Oh, yeah. In question where it says in, it has to be in writing and addressed to employer, does that mean um, like email as well is considered in writing, right? It doesn't have yep. to be. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. So jumping ahead, the next one be 3.14. Ooh, that's a big jump. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing else changed in between. So that is shift premiums. So before what was in our employee plan, Employee policy manual is shift differential to be paid to all working staff any scheduled hours outside their core business hours, so 8 to 5. The problem with that is some of our employees don't work exactly 8 to 5, and we just wanted to make it, um, it was too general, so just kind of eligible for full-time permanent employees as per their employment contract. So those eligible employees will have it stated when they sign on for the first time so they know what to expect. So just to give some clarity on that. Any comments on that? So this, you feel, will clean things up? And yes. Yeah, less vague, less employees coming in after the fact asking questions. That, do I get this? Do I not get this? So just clear up front. They sign it. They'll be aware of it. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Hmm. Okay. And our next section would be, sorry, bear with me as I flip through, would be benefits eligibility 4.1. And that's just saying employee benefits will commence after being employed for a permanent position for six months since we changed the probationary period to three months versus six months. So just clarifying that. Okay, so uh, on this. Yes. Is there a negotiated on the benefits if somebody's coming in under contract and they negotiate? Yes. Okay. They can negotiate. It's only if they're coming on a contracted position. Uh, it, any employment contract could be negotiated, depends um, on the position, that kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. Any questions there? Go ahead, okay. Councilor Orwa. If um, somebody is in one role and wants to move into another role, does it just be like continued permanent or would they then have be subject to a gap in that new position before the benefits kick in? So if it's someone that's been employed with us, let's say they've been employed for a year in a temporary position and now is moving full time, we will um, qualify that time as time served for that six months, which sounds kind of funny, but yeah, we observe and credit that time that they've already been employed. We don't make them wait an additional six months. And if they became a totally new position, like they moved into a totally new role, would that still be the same? Yeah, yeah as long as it's a permanent full-time position that they're moving into. Yeah. Okay. 4.2. Yes, and so just getting into group of benefits, it just says after six months of employment is the only thing that changed there as well. Okay. Um, and then 4.4, so again, um, LAPP is after six months of employment. Just 
clarifying that. Uh, 4.6 is professional development. So we added in the apprenticeship program that 100% of the cost would be covered. Um, right now our apprentice, it just is permanent full-time employees and part-time employees, 50%. Uh, right now our apprentices are kind of in between. They go back to school and come back and forth. But um, so we added that in and then the managers reserve the right to negotiate a repayment system at their discretion. So depending on the training and the cost and the length, they can write up a contract of some sort saying, you know, depending if it's really expensive that you have to stay employed for a certain number of years or a year. Um, and if they leave, then they have to um, repay the cost of that education. So something like that. Okay. So you're leaving it up to the managers to write these contracts? Well, I'd be involved. Okay. <laughs> Not totally. Collaboration, we'll say. Yeah. So right now, uh, do we offer this to our apprenticeships that we were paying uh, for their apprenticeship uh, cost as we go forward right now? Yes. We do, but <coughs> keep in mind the what we're uh, reimbursing is a tuition cost. So yes. So mechanics was about $850 for the year. So we were splitting that before 50-50, and now we're paying So not the books. Right. So a manager would negotiate if we're paying eight hundred and fifty dollars for first, second year, third year, whatever it is. So they would in their contract would be we expect them to say that they would be employed for six months after their last year of training. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, yeah, ALA. thanks, Your Worship. And just to just to jump in there, Dale. Um, this section was more designed, Your Worship, to cover longer employment courses or, or professional development courses that employees might take on. So something like the apprenticeships that Director Lefebvre's talking about, you know, an $800, um, you know, contribution by the town for a mechanic, which is a highly in demand skill set is, is basically something we got to come to the table with. What we wanted to do with this section was help try and address employees that wanted to do two, three, four year college or university programs and then create a, you know, a, a way to ensure that that employee didn't go and get an employer-sponsored MBA, for example, and then a month after they completed that $40,000 of coursework was all of a sudden moving to the next town down the road. So it wasn't necessarily designed to address you know, seven, eight, nine hundred dollar $900 one-off coursework. It was meant for the, the big ones and a way to, to have those conversations with employees about furthering their education to climb the corporate ladder, so to speak, that had big dollar costs involved. And then a repayment schedule for something like that. An example would be, you know, if we decided to sponsor an employee on a two-year college program at $20,000 of tuition, let's say, an acceptable or a, a reasonable negotiation with that employee would be, okay, we're willing to consider sponsoring you on this and paying you up front, but we're going to put a three-year repayment system in there. Wherein if you, if you get this designation, this credential, and you resign within the first year, you owe us the entire thing back. Year two, you owe us 50%. Year three, you owe us 30%. And then reasonably speaking, by the time we hit year four, we've already received the benefit from that employee having taken that extra coursework and being more competent at their job, and we consider it repaid at, at that point. Any questions? Well, I'm glad that we're, we're, we're bringing in apprenticeships too, because that's just something that we need to do now. Myself personally, I've apprenticed a lot of people over the years, and a lot of times in the third year, they're back for a week from getting their third year, and then they let me know that they have another job. And so it's tough. We, you know, if we're sponsoring an apprenticeship program, paying tuitions and stuff, there's got to be, of course, they get raises as, as they move through their apprenticeship program, and we'd love to keep them on because it's hard to get apprentices today. But as long as the, the manager has the ability to put some timelines of what our expectations would be afterwards. Yeah, and that's partly why we put that line in there too. Not that, that something like an apprenticeship would be completely excluded, but if, if you know the senior manager or that person's manager felt there was potentially any risk to the employee, you know, of, of doing that situation, like you say, your worship leaving, then you know, it gives us the opportunity to, to negotiate that. But you know, if it's somebody that's given us 10, 15 years already and they approach us and say, hey, can you, 
you know, sponsor me for an apprenticeship, that person's pretty sticky at that point already. You may not go down that road for those kind of dollars. So. Okay, well, I'd rather see more apprentices than a $40,000 college <laughs> education. But. Okay, any other questions on that? Okay, thank you. So next is 4.9, critical illness leave. So what I've updated there is up to employment standards. So adding the line of employees caring for critically ill child or adult must give their employee a medical certificate. This is employment standard, so the minimum standard rules. Um, so this is basically saying that um, this uh, one, our employee must be the only person um, that can care for this critically ill loved one. Um, also, there's a line in there at the top that says employees with less than 90 days of employment may be granted this leave, but it's up to the discretion of their manager. So the manager can choose to approve that leave or say, no, we've only been here less than 90 days. So just adding that in as well. Questions? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Okay, so my, I don't have any problem with that add-in. I think it's good. My only concern is I want to make sure that some way we are really keeping a lot of data then on it because one of my concerns in the past for uh, times when managers could approve was not that they had done anything wrong but the different managers would approve different things and to be able to guarantee some consistency upon and obviously I hope this is a very one-off type of scenario and doesn't yeah. happen very often but just so that we would keep a really good record and mm -hmm. be able to say that we had applied it evenly in a long situation. Yeah, so that's what's nice about having them provide that certificate or letter yeah. is that then there's proof that exactly where, actually it's at, yeah. Yeah, where it's at and what's happening with that. At what point on a leave do, does the benefit program kick in here? Um, well this is a this is a leave without pay so it's a critical illness leave so it's it says up to 36 weeks um, for the purpose of providing care to a child and then 16 weeks for an adult. So if you're leaving to take care of somebody in your family there the benefit will not support that. Um, is that correct, Dr. Yeah, I believe it's up to three days in the, the, with the benefit plan. And then after that, it's it's an unpaid leave. Okay. Yeah. Okay, any other questions regarding that? Okay. Okay. So 4.10 um, for bereavement. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Right. We'll just we'll go back to that. Yeah. Um, just... In, in that last one regarding the critical leave. Yes. So my understanding is that it's unpaid leave. Yes. Can the employee purchase the medical portion of that leave for 36 weeks? So if I choose to leave because my child is sick, can I buy my medical so that I have something? Are you talking benefits or like a long-term, short-term disability? Well, either or. I'm looking for benefits personally, like I mean, prescription drugs and. and yes. So benefits, you can you can choose after so long you pay the employer and the employee portion. Okay. So if you, <clears throat> if I like I'm obviously going on a leave shortly, I can maintain my benefits the entire leave, but I will be responsible for the employer and employee portion. So if you're, for example, if it was your spouse that was critically ill, and you had to take a leave, obviously it's in your best interest to maintain yeah. your benefits. So if that was my spouse who's self-employed, I would be interested in maintaining my benefits. So then I would pay okay. the employer and the employee. So yes, you can maintain yeah. your benefits. All right, that answers my question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so 4 by 10 bereavement leave. So the addition there is pregnancy loss, which is also as per employment standards. That was not in there before. Uh, 4.13, so leave without pay, so the addition of COVID leave, which is also per, per employment standards. That was added. And then moving on from that would be 4.16, statutory holidays. <coughs> so when a holiday falls on a weekend, the observed holiday will be recognized on the following Monday. That was not in there before. Uh, that's what the federal government and provincial government do, so just aligning with them as well. And 4.17 <coughs> vacation. So that's where we have some more changes coming in. So what was 
changes is, I'll just read it out, is all full-time salaried employees are entitled to accrue the following paid vacation based on their start date and are accrued as follows. So first year of employment, um, so once they complete their probationary period, they'll be allowed to take the prorated 10 days vacation. Um, in the past, they used to have to work a full year before being eligible to take vacation. And then it just goes through here. Um, if you're employed zero to one years, the two weeks, you're one to eight, the three weeks, and it goes on from there. Um, it says all employees are expected to take their allotted, allotted vacation time within the year of which it was earned. Um, the manager, CAO, director can approve a carryover of maximum of five vacation days on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, if the employee has not used their allotted vacation time within this period, the manager may provide a two weeks written a notice of when they have to take their vacation. And we want to get away from paying our permanent full-time staff out vacation. We'd rather them take it to um, you know, promote a work-life balance and get rid of burnout and all those things as well. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Bullock. So what's been done in the past with the holidays? Have they been just carrying them over then? or getting them paid out. Okay. Yes. Has it been excessive or? Um, I'm gonna let Director Sasky or Chris answer that. Yeah, no, it's certainly not been excessive, Councilor Bullock, but it, it there still is an impact, right? Um, so it, it yeah. to Kaylee's point, it does help with, with that employee morale, with the, you know, um, the burnout, the, the disconnecting, you know, right to disconnect from the office from, from time to time. And then also for Director Saskia for budgeting purposes, you know, and even in a single case, it, an employee who takes one week of, of paid out vacation because they weren't able or chose not to use it for a year effectively means that employee's paid for 53 weeks of, of working time that year. And we wanted to ensure that we, you know, you stayed true to the budget as much as possible as well. Councillor Barrett. Thank you, Your Worship. I see that as a two-way street as well, though, because if the employee has time coming, it has to be granted to them as well, right? So that you can't just keep them working, keep them working, nope. keep them working. So it, it's a it's a balancing act both directions. Go ahead, uh, Director Saskia. I can also add, it's a bit of an audit risk, too. So with my auditor hat on rather than my director hat, we always looked at employees that were often paid out vacation as an auditor because that's a risk. So if someone's not willing to ever vacate their position and always wants it to be paid out, are they doing something that there's a reason why they won't go? So not that that's ever been an issue here in the past, but that's something that the auditors also look at. Like they look at vacation payouts and if there's um, Joe Smith who hasn't taken a vacation in five years that's then they might start investigating why isn't he willing to vacate his position is he doing something that he shouldn't be so that's another it's an audit risk as well Go ahead, Councilor. Okay, I just have two questions on that so um, yeah it makes sense on the change on the zero to one year being the two weeks so I know we don't make them wait a year my question is say six months in are they eligible for their whole 10 days at that point, or can they only use what they've accrued up until that? Oh, okay. Yep, I know. Finish your question, Kat. I'll yeah, just put my what, hand you know. up. I got the answer for okay. that. Okay, that was it. That was the question. <laughs> Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt you. It was uh, like hitting the buzzer. I'm like, I know the answer, too. <laughs> he rang it first. <laughs> Family feud. 100 people survey. Yeah. Top answer. Uh, so, yes, the uh, it, and this was something we, we, we essentially learned this year, is that under employment standards, as an employer, we have to be ready, willing, and able to offer somebody their full vacation allotment in one lump sum chunk, and that's labor standards. We had a lackluster practice, I guess, of, of doing that in the past, where a lot of people felt, oh, geez, I've only accrued so many vacation days for this particular year, so my employment contract says I'm entitled to three, but it's June and I've only earned 1.5, so I guess that's all I can take. This, this section now in the new wording is meant to suggest to employees, and we've said it in, in one of our employee seminars, that's not the case. So as an employer, if somebody comes to us and says in March, I wanna take my full three week holidays for the first three weeks of April, we're, we're obligated to find a way to try and, and accommodate that unless it would create undue hardship on the, on the municipality. So 
so we're we're trying to make sure that that you know we're compliant with the standards in in that respect so yeah to answer that question what we would do then you know if there's a, a patchy 10-year history with that employee we might be a little bit more cautious about it but essentially an employee can go past what they've earned or accrued for for that year because we have to be willing to provide them the amount that's that's on their employment contract what happens then on the accounting system or the the HR system that Megan uses is it sort of goes into the negative so the employee has to keep working in order to then build those days back up protections do exist for us though as employers that if somebody pulls a fast one I'm gonna say and then oh geez I'm just gonna take my vacation and then quit the next week and I'll, I'll be you know legally we can actually recover overpaid vacation days and the employees last paycheck as well so the protections are all in place for it. perfect yeah and that answers my question totally and I know with our work we're in the same scenario where we just grant them because it's a little bit you're not going to tell somebody in December now you've earned your whole time you, you yeah. get your days but our contracts actually do say that you cannot take them ours actually literally say you have one point whatever per day and that you can't that so you know that's what I wondered and then my one last question on that was just on I know you said there's not a lot that have big carryovers but say theoretically for the odd one that is are we planning then on putting something through this year that does notify them they have to use it so out? yeah they'll they'll have to be some sort of grace period or grandfather <laughs> period where we can't take anyone's vacation away that they earn yeah. uh, what that'll look like I'm not sure but definitely something okay yeah maybe making <laughs> sorry Eric you're saying can add to that so there is that one caveat that on a case-by-case -case basis we can approve over five days carryover so that's talking as of December 31st five days carried forward so in as you have noted with your employment contracts that's how our prior policy manual read so if you started January 1st of this year you would not be entitled to take that one week until it was earned an entire year later so there are some employees that are you know used to that kind of the earned and get dumped in the two or three weeks at a time so those ones may ha will have to give them some lenience and to catch up to this new way of doing it so yep, thank you. so if somebody finishes their six months probation period mm -hmm. and says they want their two weeks holidays we're going to pay them for two weeks mm -hmm. well they leave for two weeks after their probation period mm -hmm they get back they're going to be paid for those two weeks yes but they won't be entitled to earn any more to the next year so they can't take another two weeks off or another two weeks that'd be their vacation period. and if they decide to leave the day they come back mm -hmm. there's which has never been done before I've never heard of anybody actually recouping that money ever in the history of the world but do we feel that there's a fair chance that we could be the first as I mentioned, Your Worship, the, the legislation says that we can, if we've overpaid somebody on vacations, then we can we can recover that at the end. I that, can that's weird. It only it is this this is only for some sort of government employees. That you're telling me in the private sector mm -hmm. that if you were on a three months probation, you came to me as the owner of the business and said you wanted your two weeks after three months, I'd have to give it to you. Yeah, technically yes up to the point of undue hardship for the for the employer and that's why I question it because that's categorically not how ours is it oh, says I, do I, not take it till I, I get it, but uh, you know I like care, <laughs> I don't know how that works but I've never heard of it but okay go ahead the director Sasky I was gonna note also for the one year the zero to one year they must not be negative as of December 31st so if you start in June you're actually only entitled to one week for your first year so we do prorate it based on their start date in the year and the other mitigating factor with that is also our payroll is always a week behind so we're getting paid this week for last week so if, if somebody took their vacation last week and it was their first year and so they took their one week that they were entitled to now, if they give me their resignation this week, I have the ability to withhold that one week's worth of pay to recover their negative vacation balance. Mm -hmm. So there is some mitigating factors for, and that, like you said, would be for employees that are in the zero to one year. Our employees that have been here longer than eight years have sufficient. Uh, yeah, I'm not really worried about them. Yeah. It's that the first, the first know, someone just gets past their probation, probation and we're gonna pay them to go on holidays the next mm -hmm. day. Uh, I, I don't, whatever you use, we'll, we'll, we'll see how that works. But, but my other question is <laughs> zero to one, 
and one to eight. So I don't care who we are or what we are. The legislation says that after five years that you have to make that extra week available. So but we're going above and beyond that, that after one year we're offering that extra week. Okay, just so everybody understands that. Okay, go ahead and say yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was just going to say exactly that, Your Worship. That's that's one area where we're exceeding the minimum requirement in the legislation by moving up that offering of the third week, you know, ahead of the, the five-year labor standards amount. Um, I did do a little bit of research, and it's mostly on par with, with the general marketplace. In? <clears throat> in Alberta, yeah. But not, but only for government type employees. But not, not private sector. Private sector doesn't do that. Private sector does whatever the private sector wants. Um, okay. You know, so, but, it, yeah, I, I studied, you know, or I looked up 10 different municipalities in Alberta. Um, three had the same offering as us, so three weeks in the second year. Uh, seven out of the 10 I looked up offer three weeks right off the bat. Okay, so there's a lot more municipalities in Alberta than that. I just, the reason I'm questioning this is I just want everybody to know that this is something that the senior admin is, is offering to the employees. This is something that they feel that it may help retain employees or or they would, I mean, because it, we're, we're stepping out of, out of line here, really. I mean, you've surveyed 10, uh, 10 different municipalities, whatever, but go ahead, Director mm -hmm. Saskia. Oh, sorry, Councillor Bowie. What do we currently have for all these stages? That's what I was just going to say. This is on par with what we've had set for the prior years. So if we were to change this now, there would be budgetary impacts. So right now, after one year, you get three weeks. After one year, you're entitled to earn three weeks. So after one year, so if you started January 1st of this year, you're entitled in the year zero to one to accrue at two weeks. So at the, if you started January 1st this year, at the end of December, if you didn't take any holidays, you would have two weeks in your bank. As of January 1st of this next year, you would then be accruing at a three week rate. So then you're earning your three weeks over your second year. So you don't actually get your three weeks until the end of your second year, so to say if that makes sense. And like it was stated, that's what was in the policy before as well. So that's not a change. Because it's six weeks to accrue. Uh, I know. <laughs> uh, again, you know, like we're here to make sure that uh, the taxpayers' money is used wisely. So I know what we've all thought about holiday situation and stuff and we know that it's way over what the private sector offers but mm -hmm. I don't Sorry. remember ever once Sorry, in my life. Sorry your worship I'll just interject here um, one thing that it is nice to attract um, new employees with is with the vacation um, I know you're referring to private sector but their wages can often be way higher than what we offer at times depending on the position so this is kind of a nice draw in like the, our our hourly rates might not be quite as high as the private sector but then it's like look then you get vacation so it's kind of that balancing act to think about for sure our, when, when we're saying that are you talking about our operator level two at public works or the foreman at parks and rec or like what part are we talking are we just talking about somebody in an executive position or in a senior management position that that would make more in the public sector than what they do here. I mean, because, you know what, I don't remember ever voting in all the years I've been on council that we did that, that the second year they were allowed to get three years, three weeks holidays. I don't remember ever. Do you guys remember that? No. Ever. But <laughs> that's because it's never, ever been around before. Anyway. We're not going to dwell on it. We're not going to beat up. I mean, if this is what you feel that we need to offer to the employees to be competitive and make them feel like, and we all said that we were taking in, like, you know, the employees were going to be a big part of this council. So, <laughs> Councillor. 
I think it's great. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's great. I think it's the appropriate thing. I think it's across the board in a lot of places, other places I've worked as well. Um, just jumping back, maybe just for just so employees realize too about vacation care. I'm sorry, I'm losing, <clears throat> I'm losing my voice here. Um, but when you were to take vacation in the next year, um, we're paying that out at your next yearly rate as well. So the budgetary process there helps. So you know, take your vacation, get your time off, rest and relax. And you know, the less carryover, the better. If you have 20 employees, a carryover one week that's getting paid at 3% COLA over that next year, it has a budgetary impact. So it's another thing to think about. Okay. Any more comments on this section? Okay. Let's move forward. Let's see. So the safety awards program it was on page 62. So, so one point. It should be 4.19, the safety awards program. That's being moved to the safety policy, so I just removed it from that section. And then the next one we're getting into is 4.20, so long service awards. So we proposed a few different things in this section, and I'm just going to flip to the old one that we had before. So what we proposed was for five consecutive years of service, it would be a percentage of gross pay of that year's wage for the calendar year. So we propose 0 0.5, 0 0.75, you can read through. Or we also entitled to awards of the previous year. So how this came to be was someone brought up our firefighters, so they're on call, right? So they're obviously not going to be making as much. So we wanted to keep it at least the $50 because if it was 0.5 for them, it would be nothing. So <laughs> you know what I mean? So we wanted to honor those uh, folks as well. Um, I feel that um, our long service awards were a little bit behind. Um, I did some research and a couple of mis municipalities, so I know they are counties, but County of Grand Prairie and County of, pardon me, flipping through my notes, <coughs> County of Mountain View. Uh, they start off at $200 per five years of service and then go from there, so that's $40 per year of service. And right now we're offering $10 per year of service. So just kind of bring us more in line with what's going on in the marketplace today. When you were doing any research, did you find any municipalities that don't offer anything? Uh, no, I did not. So what other, you gave us two cases, but what else did you find? Um, honestly, I didn't research past that. I just felt that ten dollars a year for five years of service was incredibly low mm -hmm. for to value our employees this one I really like actually and what I like about it is I also like <coughs> that you guys didn't just take the years and say at each of those years you get a certain percentage mm -hmm. um, because I've seen that in other scenarios so it was kind of one of those things that you might actually be getting more dollar figures um, because your salary might be higher, but there was never that opportunity to really change. You're still getting the same percentage of your salary all the way up. So I like that you guys actually changed the percentage as well as the years. This one here actually bothers me less than some of the other ones. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'll keep complaining about later. Um, but uh, I like this one because it really is a reward for longer, for them longer that they're there. I know it looks a little scary when we look at the percentages, but when you look at what the values are, when you look down, it's not as high as we would think it would be. And if we could actually keep that employee to that next interval, they're going to be worth way more than what that payout would be on that year. Having them that extra year, if they were debating even on that uh, 14th year, on staying to the 15th year, well, $200, they're gonna more than gain that value of $200 in that extra year you kept them. So I personally think this is a decent incentive. I will add to that our, our workforce right now is currently 60% are zero to five years of service and we only have 0.02% of our workforce that are in the highest range of the, the tw 32 to 35 years of service. So a lot of our staff are in that zero to five range. Councillor Barry. Thank you, Your Worship. I actually don't have a problem with looking at rewarding employees in this fashion. I just think it needs to be understood that it's not as common as one might think. I spent 34 years as a provincial employee. I got a little pin with a one on it and a pin
pin with a five on it and a pin with a ten on it, etc., etc., all the way up to 30 years. I never ever saw a reward, not monetary anyway. So I think that there's a there's a factor that has to be appreciated if we are giving a monetary reward because somebody's been here five, 10, 15, 20 years. I think that it's a it's a two way two way street. I think on the aspect that I'm not certain how broad it really is out there. Um, in the private sector, I know there's some pretty good bonuses thrown around in some areas, but not where I ever was. Mm. <laughs> um, thank you. <coughs> I think your stats are actually very good with the 60% <coughs> being at the five-year range. So if we don't have things like this and we don't retain and attract people, you get these gaps where we have 2.2% is at the higher range and you have a big knowledge gap in between. What happens is as soon as somebody at the upper echelon retires, your five-year person is now expected to act like a 15 or 20-year person, and it puts a lot of stress on people. So I think these things are very good and very needed, and will probably help keep us, and we can get a very good range of people in the 20 and the 15, the 10 and the 5, that will help the transition and succession planning moving forward. Officer Buck. I think this is a welcome thing to see as well. Uh, you know, just and retaining employees and attracting employees I think is so important because we know that labor, finding employees to work is difficult as it is, so if we can retain and train and uh, not lose money by not losing employees, I think this is a good perk for that. Excellent. Okay. Okay. Let's move on. Moving on to retirement. So 4.2. So um, something we've changed in here is that the retiree will be given a gift at 1% of their gross income for that calendar year. In order to qualify the gift, they must actually be retiring, so taking out their pension and being no longer paying into their pension plan. A recognition or reward for their years of service and like I will add right now we have three employees probably two now since Elaine is just retired so it'd be less than the point zero two percent hopefully they don't retire on one of the five-year increments <laughs> okay no other comments okay let's keep moving Maybe I'm gonna get that might Oh, no, our uh, <coughs> fractionization policy. Oh, no, dress code, I think, is worse. Yeah, 5.6. So, in 5.6, we added business and smart casual. And casual, we added municipal services under that as well. And you will add utilities. Oh, yeah, and I have to add utilities. Does anyone have questions about smart casual? Tim? <laughs> Sorry, your worship. I'm new. <laughs> I like the fact that it's smart, that people yes. have to dress smart. Yes, absolutely. And casual. <laughs> Mostly smart. Okay. <laughs> okay. And then, so I believe 510 are employee fraternization policy is the last section that was re revised so the important thing to keep in mind in this se section is that um, you know we're allowing our employees to have relationships as long as the conduct are, it's about the conduct right so it's how you conduct yourselves at work and when I say allowing relationships um, in there it says obviously not direct report relationships but if you know someone wants to date someone at public works that works in parks they don't report to each other it's a professional work What happens if they're in the same department? Um, that is a good question. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Councillor. Right. Then that's a conversation that yes. flows up through the manager to Kaylee's department, and then probably ultimately on my desk here, and we have to have a conversation about, uh, you know, it, it, yeah, and it's it's in there, yeah. So uh, because of that report. 
supporting relationship and the possibility for conflicts of interest or preferential treatment, then um, you know that would be one where we'd, we'd have to address it. How would you address it? Depends on the situation. But, uh, we cross that bridge if and when we come to it. As far as I know, at least under under my term, anyways, it hasn't really been an issue. I know there's there's been some examples of it in the past that were handled in various ways, but very much on a on a case by case basis. Ultimately, though, like like I say, I mean, it it would have to come down to you know the, the employee A and employee B who directly report to each other and are responsible for each other's activities can't be in a conjugal relationship yeah oh, I think that's okay. best left <coughs> yeah for sure yeah. <laughs> every situation is so different yeah no. exactly so I mean there's there's some rules around it I mean if that was the case, maybe one employee would have to move to a different department or something. I mean, there, there's ways of, yeah. of fixing it. So I didn't see anything in there about marital status at the time of these relationships. So we don't take that into account. That's, that's what, no. <laughs> Not going to comment. Good answer. Not. Okay. No, no comment, <laughs> sir. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I want to uh, say thank you for putting together a, a well uh, looked at um, the employee policy manual. And I think uh, for myself, it, it knocks us back to our number one strategic plan, which is employees first. And the mentality of having that as council and as uh, senior management, uh, if we're going to be the employer of choice, then we need to uh, ante up with a policy like this. So good on you. Uh, with all, I'm all in for that. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Rush. I was just going to echo uh, Councillor Lemko's comments, but uh, back at, at Council on the same front. So thank you, Kaylee, for uh, all the work to put this together and the senior management team. There was a lot of meetings and a lot of discussion that went into putting this together, and I really appreciate the discussion that's happened around the, the Council table here. Some slightly differing opinions on a few things, but that's okay. He, you know, I think we got a quality product here and a manual that, uh, that the staff can stand behind and, and be proud of, so thank you. Go ahead. I'm making a comment to Chris's comment. Uh-oh. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it was a very good document put together. I may or may not support it. We'll let that be a surprise, um, <laughs> as in any vote. But um, all kidding aside, I think it was a really good document. I guess the one cautionary that you will see from us, and this is what I would want to see for me when things are brought forward for these policies and plans is, I want to see them compared somewhat, you know, to similar jobs, to similar roles, to municipalities, et cetera. And I think a cautionary is that we can appreciate incentives and we definitely want them for our staff. We want staff to be retained and um, recruited and all the rest of that. However, I don't feel that we have a flair of this council because we've had discussions before on where they align. We, of course, are not a union, so I would not want to see us lining up with anything of that mandate that's something I'll categorically say up front that I want us to tailor us based upon what we need so that would be my only thing for the future and good job okay thank yeah. you very much Kaylee oh Councillor Bob oh, sorry <laughs> well I think the great work everybody and I think going along with our strategic strategic plan employees first I think we've made the moves that we need to do uh, we should be the employer of choice. I, I would expect people to be happy seeing this policy coming out, which I would entail to you know, people being more efficient, more productive, and happy to come to work. That's the type of environment we want to see. And as long as they're happy and not feeling threatened, that's great. And just want everybody to work together. And I, I think it'll improve efficiency. That's the way I see it going. So. OK. Thank you again. Okay, next up, Director Lefebvre. So the 
first attachment is simply the memorandum for the municipal or the sorry the service road boulevard licensing. Um, the attached service road boulevard licensing policy is scheduled for review, and there have been no changes to the policy. It's been reviewed. Uh, we've changed the date on it, so it's been uh, completed that way. Um, the next attachment you have is the actual policy itself, which is the same. And the changes we had talked to earlier are in the attachment, which is your third attachment. And that attachment is where it shows the area of the boulevard service area. So that's not covered in a policy because policies don't cover that. And it's typically covered in a procedure, but because we don't need a procedure for this, we're going to put it in the, uh, in the agreement where it's always been. So we've adapted and changed the, uh, the agreement. So you can see Schedule A. Of it shows that it now includes the service road frontage in front on the south side of the previous Bueller building. So this area then, like all other agreements, the business frontage will be uh, allowed to, for $10 per year fee, be able to advertise and place for display on that the town's portion of that boulevard um, materials that relate to the business that they're running. Okay, any questions? Okay, we'll see this on Monday night. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Director Saski. Thank you, Worship. So before you hear, I have the attached draft machinery and equipment incentive tax exemption bylaw. That is a large sum of words. Um, this bylaw outlines the requirements for an applicant to be granted a tax incentive agreement exempting them from paying machinery and equipment tax for a period of no more than 15 years. Key items to note on this bylaw is that it allows for the exemption to take effect as of the commercial operation date pending all requirements laid out in the bylaw are met. The period of exemption is good for up to 15 taxation years. Any applications made in the years preceding adoption of this bylaw will be entitled to the exemption equal to the remaining period of the 15 year term. And the granted exemption is 100% of machinery and equipment assessment taxation for the duration of the bylaw with the exception of any requisitions on the related property as noted on 11.1B of the bylaw. And the bylaw details the criteria to obtain an exemption, the process for submission and the appeal process. The application fee we set a nominal fee for $100. That is something that we're looking for council input if we would like to change it. Um, similar bylaws that I've noted, uh, Strathcona County, for example, their fee is $5,000 per, um, per, application. per application. So um, I set a nominal fee of 100. I am open to reducing it or removing it. So. Any comments? And it might be me maybe reading it wrong, but any applications made in years preceding the adoption, wouldn't it be after the adoption? Proceeding. Yeah, that might be me. But yes. So, uh, Councillor Bullock? Well, I went through the policy and uh, the bylaw, and I like it, of course. And as for the $100, if it's just $100, I'm even willing to see that waived. Actually, I want the business to know that Vegreville is open for business. And we want to be the major place to attract businesses to this town. We're doing everything we can to get small business and big business here. And I want to see that succeed and see the town grow. So I will be supporting that bylaw. Okay, so is there any more discussion on the $100 fee for the application for the exemption? Because there's... Right now, there is businesses in town that are paying m and &E tax, and there are some that aren't. We don't know why some aren't, because we've never really gone out there, and their assessor has never pointed out to us that this business should be paying. And it's the assessor that sets what the, uh, the value of the equipment and machinery is worth. But we all know why we're doing this. We are building a new park. We are trying to attract large industry which comes with heavy machinery and to tie our hands and not be able to negotiate to 
bring somebody in. We know today that uh, it will be out in the news probably tomorrow. That was one of the reasons that AA Trailers, Concord Industries, expressed interest to coming to this municipality because their purchase of their upcoming equipment to retool here is this was a big part of it was that we were going to forgive the m e tax so moving forward this is one of the another tool in our toolbox as we're trying to bring industry into our our park so i guess the question is do who would support moving forward with the hundred dollar fee uh, councillor barry uh, thank you, Your Worship. I don't really have a problem whether we have the fee or not the fee. Mine is a question. Is the onus on the business to contact and make the application? But we will be uh, making it known to the community that this is available so that uh, somebody isn't just sitting in the dark and paying the tax that they could actually get an exe exemption for. I can add to that. So other than um, one that we all know in particular, there's approximately only four other roles that have machinery and equipment, and to those long-standing businesses, we will reach out and touch base with them. And they do not have significant tax right now. It's about $1,000. So for a follow-up on that question, as you, you have pointed out, Your Worship, this would be also in negotiations that would be informed of anybody who is looking at coming to town, that it this is an advantage to being here. It would be a big selling feature that we're willing to offer. We will be advertising it for sure. GAO like yeah, thanks, Your Worship. I was just going to sort of make that point as well in discussions with our uh, uh, community engagement economic development manager there. Yeah, we're, we're hoping to promote the heck out of this. This is, to your point, you're a huge selling feature to attract those those larger manufacturing operations to town, um, and yeah, we're gonna we're gonna do everything we can to make this known as, as possible. So the length of this bylaw is for 15 years, and that's what the Municipal Government Act allows us to do. So, if somebody signs these applications and it's their golden ticket, three councils from now or two councils from now may say that they're going to revoke that bylaw. But as long as the, the, the people, the businesses have the golden ticket, then that can never change within that 15 years. So long as everybody understands that. Okay, so do you guys want it to come to council with the $100 application fee attached to it? Or do you want to remove it? Or do you want to wait till Monday to make a decision? Right now, the, the way it looks right now, what we would have would be five hundred dollars. Right now, the way we set in the right now, I mean, we've already talked to industry uh, that we're trying to attract here. We've made similar offers, not fifteen years, but I would imagine moving forward, if this bylaw passes, we will be reaching out to those industries and business people and and saying that we are now willing to extend past what our first initial offer was councillor barry thank you worship um is it significant for the paperwork that an administration is going to have to do that we should charge a hundred dollars or is it really insignificant and we could waive it It really depends on the number of applications that we get. If we get 100 applications, then obviously that's going to bog down one employee to determine that amount. But That would be 100 industries. Yeah, I was going to say that would, be, <laughs> that would be a really good problem to have. So at this point in time, assuming that people aren't going to be taking advantage of this overbearingly, because obviously there's only five roles in town that actually have a machinery and equipment, um, anyone that does apply that doesn't have a machinery and equipment assessment, we would just deny that application almost immediately. So, I'm comfortable, I'm, I'm comfortable with uh, removing the fee. Okay. <coughs> okay, so for our council meeting, the motion on this bylaw will come with no other attachments. It'll just be we're voting on the bylaw as presented to us.
Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up, CAO Leggett. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, so, topic on this one is uh, 2023 Canada Day fireworks. Um, background is Protective Services Department has been coordinating with vendors to purchase fireworks for the 2023 uh, Canada Day fireworks. This item uh, was only budgeted for $5,000 in the 2023 budget. Uh, as the town had previously been able to purchase the fireworks for $5,000 and have a staff member who was licensed uh, set them off. Um, we no longer have that resource on uh, on our crew, so um, to now hire somebody for a decent fireworks show that comes along with the appropriate licensing and, and insurance, uh, we've been provided a, a quote of $10,000. Uh, so the fireworks show uh, would cost an additional $5,000 over the budgeted amount. Uh, options offered today uh, are that town council approve the quote as presented or that uh, we reject the quote and that would likely mean we'd, we'd have to forego uh, any fireworks here for 2023. Any discussion? Go ahead, Councilor Lemko. Well, this question probably would go to uh, Director Lefebvre. Uh, so there's nobody that's certified to uh, fire fireworks off left in the fire department? Second question to that would be, uh, what's the cost to get uh, our department or some members of our department certified in the ability to uh, do what's being asked here? I'd probably refer that to the fire chief. Who uh, just we, happens to be here this evening. <laughs> 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 Not related to this, obviously, yeah. but... Uh, comment I think that our residents definitely look forward to the fireworks in Canada Day I think they'd be extremely disappointed if we were to say that we're not going to provide the fireworks um, so from that part of it I think that's that's a good idea I'm my only question is did we get more than one quote or is it feasible to even get more than one quote thank you Go ahead, Jesse. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. So just to answer that, Councilor Barry, we're only sitting on one right now. However, that quote seems reasonable in, in my experience. My last municipality was only 900 people, and we spent between seven and $9,000 a year on, on exactly the same thing, and that was going back a couple of years now. So the 10000 didn't seem un, unreasonable in terms of the quote. And then to, to touch on your point uh, a moment ago, Councilor Lenko, and to echo, echo what the Chief is saying, I would highly recommend that, yeah, if we're going to do licensed fireworks displays, that we hire a contractor to do it because that entire liability and licensing piece falls on that individual as opposed to the municipality. We've all seen those videos on YouTube where fireworks displays go boom. I would absolutely not want to be the person stick handling that legal file. It, it, you know, if it's, if it's a, a private company, a licensed individual setting that off, it falls entirely on them to, to make sure that's safe. And typically that's the way it goes, that the fire departments are there for the safety aspect to put out, you know, to provide um, traffic control, that type of thing, in the unlikely event that fireworks go sideways. But my, my recommendation would definitely be to make sure that it's, it's, a, it's a third party individual that's licensed lighting the fuses on them. Okay, Councilor Bullock. Sir, didn't they say that approximately approximately 20 minutes long. How long have our fireworks lasted before? I never really timed it. Uh, 
uh, I've been a part of the last two uh, years, and uh, each were about 20 minutes. Um, a, a couple of years ago, there was a shift in terms of uh, how the town of Vegreville put on the fireworks display, um, and at that point, uh, it, they actually went from what I was hearing, you know, 13 to 15 minutes to north of 15, uh, even closer to 20 one minutes. Now that's not lighting up the sky the entire time by any stretch of the imagination, but it is, uh, yeah, about a 20 to 25 minute at present time display. I guess uh, I definitely would like to see if there's anyone else to give a quote on this as well for comparison. And it shows that he carries 2 million liability. Is that even enough these days? So have we asked for other pricing? No. No, like I mentioned, Your Worship, that that number seemed pretty reasonable in my experience. We just decided to present that to Council here tonight and see what your thoughts were. Okay. So, what? Go ahead, James. Uh, it, we did not receive a quote, but I do know that we reached out to another company, and uh, to put it mildly we were sort of laughed at because they book years in advance just so every, just so council's aware they 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 had booked this year's July 1st fireworks display from what uh, Alan had told me 2 years ago and he said uh, no it's uh, i believe um uh, this contact uh uncle johns i think is the name of the company uh, there was a uh, a contact or a relationship forged, albeit a minor one, um, in terms of, hi, I'm so-and-so, and a conversation had, and as a result, he was uh, willing to make sure Vegreville was squeezed into his schedule for this year. But I do know that several of these uh, uh, of these companies are booking years in advance. You guys want to change the date? <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> Councillor Perry. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, to me, it's, it's a question of curiosity. Maybe it'll be considered as silly, but the GST, do we recoup that? Yes. Because it makes a difference in the cost. Thank you. Okay, so the Councillor Lemko. Yes, and, and thanks for asking my question, Chief. Um, and I agree with uh, our, our, our Chief and uh, CEO Leggett regarding moving ourselves as a fire department away from such things as firing fireworks. Uh, I, I totally agree with that. Uh, Uncle John's, uh, I believe, supplied the fireworks uh, for our shoot last time. Um, and uh, and that, but uh, our tourism advisory board is currently working on a Canada Day uh, theme for the park for that, uh, that looks like evening, uh, culminating with the fireworks uh, at the end. So uh, it's part of a tourism initiative, and I would support the additional costs um, to get this done and continue on years to come as fireworks is important to a lot of people. If it rains. Councillor Curtis. Thank you. I, I would support this too, and might as well book him for next year. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Just uh, one more quick comment here before, uh, but, but you know, before you guys make your decision on it, um, I did look up a grant that I'd previously used to for Canada Day festivities. It's called the Celebrate Canada Grant. It's a it's a federal grant. Um, it should be available to us if we plan ahead and look at, at future years. But by the time this crossed my desk and I discussed it with staff, we we looked it up and it was already closed for the year. So, um, so it might just be this one year, and then we can. Definitely add that one to the list of, of grants to go shopping for. In in the past, I'd applied that for that every year. We were never denied. So, uh, yeah, there's likely something on the table moving forward. Good question. Councillor Bullock. I see that he says he may cancel up to two business days prior at no cost. Let's say they throw a fire ban on July 1st. Any, what happens then? I guess we forfeit the ten grand. Well, we, yeah. yeah. We would be the one paying the ban, right? Yeah. Thank you, uh, thank you, Director Sasku. Uh, she she's pointed out second to last paragraph. 
We cannot shoot if there is a fire ban or high winds. It is unsafe and illegal. If we cancel the show because of a fire ban or high winds, you will receive a full refund. Yeah. Okay, so this will come to Monday's meeting and uh, we'll need a motion on it. Okay, let's move on to uh, some round table. We'll start with Councillor Barry. Thank you, Worship. I really don't have a lot to try and speak of. Uh, most of the questions are just as to what's going on around town, uh, lots that are becoming vacant or cleaned up, or et cetera. And the curiosities, of course, which don't have detailed answers to right now but um, for the most part it's just uh, an observation that although most years we have a very high river this year we've got just a little bit of water running it's very dry out there extremely dry okay thank you councillor Bullock don't really have much just the excitement around Foxview and the BMX Track, just people asking what's going on. That's all I got. They've been out of the picture a little while. Okay, Councilor Warwick. Um, I think people are out and about and starting to walk and enjoy things. So, um, one little thing I w had a call over the weekend, so I went for a walk last mm, Sunday night, whatever, yeah, I think what day it was, um, and did see. Uh, so just if we can check at our accessibility park, um, of course, the ground, the, the flooring, whatever we want to call it, that we've laid down is kind of like, it's that almost like repurposed material. Um, I noticed on the corner, which would be on the northeast corner of that um, playground, it has a chunk that's out of it. And because the kind it is, when you have that lip and it's out and torn, it's where there's going to be people starting to pick at it and pull at it. So I just thought I'd mention that. So somebody mentioned it to me and I did go actually see it and there is a, a corner taken out of it there. So just might be a good idea to grab it before it becomes a thing. Yep. Councilor Curtis. Thank you. <coughs> I just had some good talk around the, you know, the end of the hockey season and um, <coughs> the prospects and the uh, three on three that was put on. So a big thank you, I think, to the Veg Minor Hockey who decided to, you know, help us use that uh, extension in a, in a positive way. And I think a lot of the kids that showed up had a lot of fun. And going forward, I think it's, you know, maybe a viable option to, you know, add those extra week or two if, if necessary. Um, and then I'm just excited around our tourism board's um, discussion about some of the potentials that are being brought for, for activities this year, not just Canada Day, but, you know, how it ties into economic development and, and you know, giving people a reason to want to come for the weekend. So excited to see that move on. Thank you. Okay, so does anybody want to know what it would cost the town to keep the, uh, the rink running? The extra time, or does, does anybody care? Or like, I know that we, we lose money in every facility and stuff, but does anybody really want to know what the cost actually is? Are you talking for the three weeks we yeah. did this year, or are you talking about trying to do it for, for well, longer? Like, do, would it help your decision like for next year if you actually knew well, like, 100 an budgeted amount, what it cost or anything? 100% it would. Okay. So that would help you make an informed decision next year about how long they would leave the ice in. Yeah, if it doesn't make sense, it doesn't make sense. However, what we did this year was a benefit to the community, and I was just bringing that up. Yeah, and, and, and I get that. Right. And this was the first, not the first year that we've done it, but there was interest, and it worked out well with the three-on-three. -three. So, I mean making decisions next year towards the end of the year if we're looking at it again it would be nice to know 
what it's going to cost taxpayers, you know, I mean, because again, we, we know we're going to operate it for this amount of time, and we know what our losses are going to be in the facility. But then we, we knew exactly how much more, what we were looking at, and what the benefit would be from it. Mm. I mean, I would imagine they'd like to do a three-on-three -three again next year. So uh, if we could mm. get that information available. And I really would like to see that, not about necessarily when we do it, but overall, it lets us know what we're dealing with because we said, okay, well, we'll extend it two weeks or whatnot. Mm. But let's find out what was the cost in two weeks versus potentially what would it cost for that month. I mean, why I say that is if we're planning ahead of time, we could then reach out to mm -hmm. other groups that might have still utilized it or there was already some caps going on that we could have done. So just if we knew what it cost, we'd know how much to recoup. So any information we could get, I would think it'd be really good. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. And we're happy to do that for you to echo Councillor Curtis's comments. The manager of Parks and Rec has commented that, yeah, it was extremely well used. Great feedback from it for, for that extra time for sure so uh, we're happy to look into that what would be the length folks how many more weeks are we looking to end of may here maybe or longer even oh i don't know i think where we're at this year worked out fairly well okay. i mean end of may because now we're very limited in how many people are actually using it right, right? so i mean if there's a, a a camp that we could bring in or that we know of that we could le so offer that because we know we're bringing people to the town, and then we got to look at how many on the three on three, how many taxpayers benefited from variable, right? Because we know all the minor hockey was not involved, and so again, the numbers go down, but the costs go up to operate it. So, but just having some information early in the year so that we could let minor hockey know and ice user groups that there's the potential or that we're going to run another three weeks and maybe Hockey Canada or Hockey Alberta may be looking to, to hold a camp. Okay. Go ahead. And then, sorry, just one more. I got a text message, so uh, clearly the manager of Parks and Rec is uh, watching our meeting right <laughs> now. Uh, <laughs> uh, and he was uh, asking me to mention to you, Councilor Moore, they're already in the process of getting quoting for that rubber net. Okay. He's on the ball, holy. <laughs> Councillor Lemko. Thanks, Your Worship. Uh, nothing really to uh, report uh, other than uh, exciting to see the amount of uh, busyness in our community. And it's attracting people. Um, I'm fortunate enough uh, that I get to uh, watch uh, the drive through at Tim Hortons in the morning having a cup of coffee, and that thing never ends. Majority of people driving through there I don't recognize. So there's an abundance of people and I'm there for half an hour and it never ends. So that just tells you about how busy that uh, this community is. Uh, also, um, the Foxview uh, Estates, the park, um, even though we're not uh, finished uh, doing the BMX park, it's being utilized by bicyclists and children. They're either climbing the thing, riding their bicycles on there. Uh, it's exciting to see because there's kids uh, all over the place on that mountain of dirt and, and all that. So it's exciting, kids in the community. Thank you. Okay, uh, well, um, it sure was nice to, to be up at uh, the uh, former Bueller site today and uh, seeing uh, Abe Martins and his team up there, AA Trailers and Concord Industries, and listening to some of their plans about how they're going to utilize the building and how they're going to move forward. and. The fact that they asked uh, if we could grade the road a bit because they got a lot of stuff to haul it down. <laughs> and uh, so that was very positive. Um, I have been contacted by a few people when we do the assessment on sidewalk repairs. So directly to Fave, if you could tell us the process about when we identify a certain portion of sidewalks that need to be repaired and how that works it works by either staff or the manager noticing damage and reporting it to the manager or quite likely and usually it's the public that will call in and let us know that there's a, an issue and that gets put on a priority list then the manager would go out and rate them all and see where they're at and we'll have a look at them in the fall 
and then we let them go through a freeze thaw cycle in the summertime and then we pick the top of the priority list and compare it to our budget and we repair and not every sidewalk that has a crack in it is going to get replaced um, sometimes they'll lift a little bit in the winter and then in the spring they settle back down and, and go flat so it has to be a, a tripping hazard something we can't grind out or, or repair because of the cost so okay that process thank you very it much it will be evaluated again here shortly this spring as our concrete guy wants to roll in right away so excellent I noticed uh, on the former full throttle site that we have some environmental testers on site. Are those are our guys? Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, another thing that I'd like to talk about is where we're at with uh, derelict housing, um, where we're at with uh, another part, another uh, commercial property in town that is um, this is something that the public is really wants to know and I've got some concerned residents on the other side of town and want to know why we are not moving forward and forcing somebody to get that ugly mess out of their yard uh, from their view and I told them it's a process but if we can get an update by Monday on some of the derelict properties um, I've asked a couple of times now I know some in people that were served on some derelict housing came in and signed agreements on dates that they would have these houses tore down. So at no time have we found any of these signed agreement is what I'm I'm taking right from. No, that's in doing some digging, Your Worship, we did find some documents that were a couple of years old as you, as you suggest there. So uh, yeah, we're applying those to the to the files and you know sort of picking up where they where they left off with those so so realistically when can council expect to see a plan about how we're going to move forward because again we thought that those houses that we looked at a couple of years ago would be not there we've recognized now that it's a bit of a challenge when we've made some changes to the organization, the way that uh, things are handled, what would you say would, so the public would know, at what point do you think that we would be able to go in and start removing some of these houses that we've designated as uh, unsafe? Yeah, so on, you know, unless we get one that proves to be you know one or more I suppose that proves to be legislatively problematic for whatever reason and I'm thinking of one per one property in particular where we know the owner is um, uh, did not mentally capable or in a, in a state right now where he can address letters you know regarding his property so that's an example of one that we've got some additional hoops we got to jump through before we can go ahead and and demolish that house but um, realistically we're hoping to have them all done by the end of the, the construction season in, in you know some form or another so so as council and residents of Vagerville we will hear a plan fairly soon about what it looks like moving forward yeah I just made a note here that I'm gonna speak with the manager of, uh, of that department and we'll issue a written plan to, to council here okay perfect that's all I have um, so we'll move on to director highlights and we're going to start with director Saskia thank you worship every day Dale's disappointed uh, I have a couple things for you so administration has been working on the implementation of virtual town hall so we have launched it internally and internal employees are making online payments to aid us in setting up our deposit and reconciliation procedures of the new online payment system before we go live to the public. Obviously, we want to make sure we receive and record any payments made online. So we're doing internal and making sure when people report to me that they've made a payment that we are able to see them and get have them processed quickly. Uh, what I'm asking of council today is their opinion of online payments or any kind of credit card payments in excess of $500. The merchant fees we're seeing for large payments are sometimes close to 10% of a fee. 
So in one recent case, a $20,000 credit card payment over the phone had a related merchant fee of $2,000. Uh, virtual town hall allows us to charge a fee, say 3%, 5%, to be consistent with other businesses on payments over $500. Uh, you could charge a flat fee for everything, or you could do an escalated fee, so 0% for under 500, and then 0.1% for 500 to 10,000, and then 10% over 10,000. You could do riders like that. Is council interested in charging a credit card fee for payments over a threshold? If you are, I would recommend applying this across the board so that if people come in to pay, they would also be charged the fee because otherwise people are like, oh, I just won't use this new virtual town hall. I'll just come into the um, town hall and pay it. Um, I can bring a more in-depth discussion to the next ledge meeting if that's something that council's interested in pursuing. And like I said, currently over the phone credit card payments are what is costing us the most in fees. And we're looking to eliminate the over the phone payments and allow for virtual town hall payment processing and in-person credit card processing, processing only so that we're avoiding those high fees. Go ahead, Councillor Barrett. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, are part of these fees uh, applied to the property taxes when they're collected? So we get charged those fees if someone pays their property taxes, but we don't currently have anything in our fees and charges bylaw where that goes back onto the tax roll or that we're charging those rate payers that are paying property taxes or any kind of other payments with a credit card. It's my understanding then is that, that we are to collect all of the tax mm -hmm. and if we're not collecting the fee for processing that way we're not collecting all of the tax. Yes. So, so I think in that aspect we distinctly have to charge a fee if they're using a credit card. I go ahead, the CEO. Yeah, like thank you, Worship, and thanks for uh, bringing that up, Councillor Barry. You're 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 correct, and this is this is a matter that went through BC, you know, a number of years ago too. Where exactly that the legislation states that we're required to collect a certain amount of net taxes to satisfy those those taxes, but if we're you know just to use easy numbers, you know, did we we levy a fifteen hundred dollar um, you know, tax levy on a particular property, we pay a 2% credit card fee. We're only, we're only at the end of the day collecting $1,470 from that property because we've paid the fee ourselves to process that transaction on behalf of, of the property owner. So, uh, so I know from, from my travels, a lot of municipalities, especially the smaller ones, we're faced with sort of one or two options, you know, implement a fee system like that or decline to take taxes by way of credit card which upset a lot of residents, of course, but it was kind of a one or the other type scenario. So I don't specifically know how that fits into the, the nitty gritty legislation in Alberta, but it, it, you know, it's, you know, regardless outside of that, the, your, your point holds true that when we, when we collect taxes paid for by a credit card, we're actually collecting less than we're levying at the end of the day because of the fees that we pay. Councilor Bullock. I agree with Councillor Barry because I, I don't feel a taxpayer in this town should be uh, paying for somebody else to use their credit card. So I think a fee would be justifiable, an equal fee to what the charge is. I'm good with that. I, yeah, because absolutely, if I owe you $1,000, I still have to pay you that 1000 So I get that. I just don't want to see us taking away the credit card option. Um, no matter what, I'd like to see that be an option. Sometimes people just need it on certain payments. So I'm okay with making sure that we physically levy exactly what we're owed. I just don't want to see us lose that option. Okay, well, I'm pretty sure this is the ninth year that I've talked about this. And uh, <laughs> a couple of years ago, it was over $90,000 that we lost in credit card fees. And it doesn't make any sense, and you're right. But the worst part is is that we're losing to these fees, especially when they phone them in and don't use our machine or not using our new uh, software package, is that it, it even increases. So by somebody paying a fee of $20,000, we lost $2,000 of it. Mm -hmm. um, 
there's requisitions to be paid. So if we're losing already on the what we're collecting the requisition, we still have to pay 100% of it. So we better do something and do it in a hurry because I know when I implemented that in my business that I was going to start charging anything over $500. Be up to then, and the interest rates were a lot lower and stuff then, I was willing to take a small loss so someone could get 5,000 air miles. But when it starts adding up on those high-end cards on a twenty to $30,000 bill when you're losing $600, $700 back a couple of years ago what interest rates were, so I would imagine we'll be well over a hundred and some thousand lost in, in fees at tax time this year. And that money, we budgeted pretty close, I thought. The, at the end of our budget, what did we have left? It wasn't much. Councilor Curtis. Thank you. <coughs> Is there any other provider we can get or <coughs> another company that does a flat rate? Just anyway, if we're going to implement this, that we've, you know, Done our due diligence that we're not just charging 10% for a $20,000, and there's other options where it's lower. So if we are going to do it, which we have to, if we can get it that it's lower or that it's flat, have we explored those options or can we? Yeah, so we switched merchant providers in 2019, I believe, because we had done a, a fairly in-depth study of that. But long story short, over-the-phone payments are not verified, so then somebody can do an over-the-phone payment, and then we say no the card's not present and then if they wanted to do another a charge back then the town would be responsible for that payment too so there are higher risk ones that's why there's higher risk fees so with the implementation of virtual town hall there's no reason that somebody can't pay their accounts receivable or their dog license or anything 24 hours a day on our system so then at least that's a verified payment and they're taking the risk not the town and then looking at limiting those really high transaction fees so the twenty thousand dollar payments charging the fees for those bigger transactions Go ahead. Uh, sorry to interrupt Chitowski. does that mean though like through either system though even on the smaller ones are we still paying a fee yes we pay a fee for every single card transaction including i believe even debit there's there's a fee associated because they're providing us a service otherwise it's cash and I guess, but if we accept a check, we're not currently paying, is that correct? We pay bank fees on deposits of checks too. So that's what I mean. So like the, the small transactions, it's kind of the cost of doing business, the cost of having a bank account, et cetera. But it's the larger credit card payments where we're really seeing an, a huge jump in the cost of the transaction versus. Yeah, and I, I totally, I get that. I just, at the end of the day, I wanna make sure that we no matter what our being fair is to how somebody would apply to cross that we that we are collecting 100% of that requisition as as you said so okay Councilor Rear. thank you worship but yes i think that's the point i'm trying to make is i believe that we're obligated to collect 100% and i would like to ask administration if CL Leggett would check into that to see whether i am correct on that or whether it's just my impression of it but I do believe that we have to collect 100% of the taxes. So when we're not, I think we have to take a look at, are we allowed to have that as a cost of doing business? And we do, to interject, we do collect 100%. We have bank fees budgeted. So that expense is budgeted, but where we're seeing the variations is when these high cost credit cards are putting $20,000 transactions through our bank fee budget is just having to climb and climb every year because more and more people are resorting to credit card payments. So that, like, we we have the expense and the revenue come through. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. And part of it, too, is that there's a substantial difference in a debit card transaction fee versus a, a credit card one. So the debit card, when, you know, when a merchant signs up for, yeah, for, for a debit card system, um, oftentimes it's, it's, it's even charged per, per batch. So it's a flat fee per 100 transactions or a flat fee per 200 transactions. Whereas a credit card, generally speaking, it's like 2% for every single transaction across the board. Um, you know, there's some variation there as, as Director Saskia mentioned, but um, you know, that's, that's an issue. And to the mayor's point, you know, we have, we have um, people we're doing business with that are coming to us and they're saying, well, I want to use my high rate points card for
for this large transaction because it benefits me. And then we find out that, well, okay, it did, because we were willing to accommodate that transaction, we eat a 10% fee. Yeah, that's not necessarily fair to us as an organization to, to you know, do that transaction. So, anyways, food for thought. Well, to be upfront, and I've said it every year, after I pay my taxes with my Air Miles card, <laughs> thank you. We should change this. But, and the higher the rewards on your card, the higher the cost, the charge. So, I've never shied away from it. I've said it's dumb, and I'm going to keep taking advantage of it like everybody else. But I can walk in here with a check, too. So I really, it, the cost of doing business on credit cards today is it's not fair that the rest of the property taxes, uh, residents in town are offsetting cost so people can have holidays. So if you told me that I can use my Air Miles, my, my Air Miles card, well, I have to pay 7% more because that's what you're going to lose, I would just give you a check. So I think it's pretty simple. We're not looking to bust out of the bank here. What we do to do is find a system, a method that works, that we can collect exactly what we're supposed to collect. So I trust uh, Director Saskew that by tomorrow afternoon you'll have that in place. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll give you until Monday. By when do you think that we'll see a recommendation from you, from your department about what you feel that we should move forward with this? Well, at this point in time, because this legislative meeting, we brought up the topic. So for the next legislative meeting, I can have a detailed memo with some options. And then we can, if we have to look at changing fees and charges or putting an additional fee or charge in, we can have that for the next council meeting. So the end of the month. Okay, so for the next ledge meeting, we're going to get some more information, and then by the, the the last meeting in May, I would expect that we'll have enough information and that we were going to make a, a decision what we're going to do a month before the taxes are collected. Mm -hmm. Okay, what else you got? That is all I have. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I guess we're now we'll go to Director Lefebvre. <laughs> Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, the director highlights are that we are currently working with Vantage Builders uh, for an equipment storage building design. We're uh, on our way. We've got an agreement together, and we'll be meeting up with their engineer team and then a list of our needs and what they have and see what's out there. And um, we're looking forward to, to wrapping up to bring a proposal up to council. Uh, we're also right this week reviewing the metal collection request for proposal from our landfill as that comes up. So we had interest of approximately seven vendors. So we're just in the process of finalizing the details of what each one offers and how we determine a metal price. And we will uh, be moving forward on that. The force main project, we've completed the force main installation review of the project. I still am waiting for some information from our engineer firm uh, on the interior because we have a lot of valves, check valves, things going on for rebuild on the inside of the sewer lift as well. So I'm just waiting for the last bits of that and that will stem from some supply issues because even as we roll through to the relationship with Prosperity Park, um, as you remember when our lift station was being built, we ordered the standby generator, didn't matter if you went Detroit, Cummins, uh, I'm sorry, Cummins or Caterpillar, uh, it was 34 and 36 weeks out in delivery now similar orders like that from other lift stations are trying to propose are, get this, 90 weeks out with some of this stuff. Um, the MCC panels like we have in ours, that was in the Master Control Center, uh, comes pre-built, they're 110 weeks out after date of order. So it's throwing a, a, a lot of issues into construction norms that used to be like you put in your tender, for example, and then put down my uh, anticipated finish date is this, and they, they can't provide that can't finish if they can't get that information so so that's why we're still bouncing around with with some of the interior valving and stuff so once we get that it won't take long because we've gone through already in detail um, good news uh, is that on prosperity industrial park also the uh, inline is back on site they were out earlier in the week starting to dewater and clean things up and I see they've been out there prior to that working on some of the equipment 
also another supply issue there through COVID. They were ready to unload a bunch of their heavy industrial uh, equipment, the dozers, buggies, things like that, and then fell into a problem where they couldn't. And now the machines, as we saw last summer, some of them were <coughs> breaking down a little more frequent because they're end of life and out of hours and, and it's time. So now as, as they return, the orders are in and they're expecting some new equipment. That is their problem, not ours. Uh, but it's nice to see that they're out and we had a meeting with them just early this week and they're ready to get going and get this part of the on-site of Prosperity. They want that done, wrapped up out of the road so they can move on to other projects uh, that they have. So we're number one on the list this year for that. And I'd like to say that concludes my report. Unless you want to hear about full throttle. I'd go ahead. Okay. Let's go over that. <laughs> <laughs> We have Pinchin out there uh, on Monday doing the first calls and locates uh, have, have been completed. They will be there tomorrow and Friday and they will be drilling, which is really good to get them in early. And uh, our conversation with them uh, when I talked with Brianne is that they will have uh, analytical studies done by end of next week, which is again quick. And then from there we can get a timeline on when we can put this to a proposal and get a dollar tied to it. So I'm, I'm really excited that things turned our way and went click, 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 and we can get an answer relatively soon as opposed to waiting for mid midsummer or sometime. So so that's good news. We'll get some information here soon. Excellent. Perfect. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. CAO highlights and action report. Thank you, Your Worship. So uh, good progress on the uh, council action item list. Uh, bunch of stuff noted off as complete. Um, won't go through each and every one. We'll just entertain questions if you guys want to know about any particular line. Uh, the 35. Yep. <laughs> so what I find when I wait to gather supporting uh, information and stuff, I'm, I think when you're disappointed, you should get the letter out as quickly as possible so that they know that you're disappointed. So you want to wait. I, I see what you sent back. Uh, you see, see me on it. The a, yeah, the uh, basically that we still don't believe their process has any merit to it. That we know that these people weren't here, and we were built for it, and we are going to start our own practice of trying to uh, take this on ourselves. I can. I'm happy to write a similar email back to uh, the RCMP brass, just letting them know that we're undertaking that if you want. Yeah. I mean, you don't have to swear a lot in it. <laughs> but I think letting them know how disappointed we were when, you know, they were coming here, they're all concerned, and basically it was horse hockey that they, they delivered to us here, to say it really. And I, I just think that they should know that we were very disappointed in the fact that they were their unwillingness to see just well, how unfair they were being treated. Like they didn't do any work whatsoever other than they went back later the day and emailed us back. They didn't look into any of our concerns. And I think that's what their message is right now, is that, oh, we're, we're willing to listen. So I, I, I think we should send something back. I really do. Um, no matter what. We can do whatever we can on this, on our own behalf here to try to log and chart how many uh, boots we have on the ground, but I think they should know that you know that we were not happy with their response. We still don't believe anything they're saying, and and then get mean from there. Any other questions on the? Go ahead, Councillor Barry. Oops, sorry. Thank you, Worship. Number forty. Um, has there been some contact to administration concerning a potential lease? Because um, I'm still waiting to see if they're going to discuss anything further. I've given them information uh, from our last meeting, and I'm still waiting to see after they have a further board meeting as to whether they're going to proceed or not proceed. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Berry. I'm. Uh, I haven't had any contact with them 
personally as of yet, but we've uh, we've set that to be out towards the end of the month here. So. Yeah, I'm expecting that I will likely be contacted first. Okay. That's the way it's been going just right now, and I just I haven't. I'm waiting to see if it's going to be uh, further discussions or stopped. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Oh, Council Warwick. This is just on the RCMP letter, actually, as well. Um, yeah, I agree. We need to put some back to them. The timing is somewhat unfortunate right now, provincially, but I would suggest that we CC our Justice Minister. Um, because it might be motivation somewhat for them to, especially if what we come back is say that we were disappointed, that we thought we had a wholesome discussion and that the speediness of the response alone let us know that there wasn't any deep dive into it. And we are feel it's unfortunate when we're talking about billing and reconciling um, invoices and we're sharing a legitimate concern that ends up being a safety concern. And I, I would CC, I don't know, obviously up to your worship, but I think that CCing the minister sometimes kind of just does a bit of an accountability of them. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that at all. I mean, his department has given out grants for municipalities to look at the supplying their own policing. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Out here at Capital and Special Capital Projects. And special Projects. Uh, yeah, also a uh, good uptake on, on those over the last uh, over the last reporting period here. Several items that we've noted off as complete with the pricing that we had available. Uh, almost exclusively across the board, things have been uh, at or slightly under budget with one exception, uh, that being the scissor lift. It came in slightly more expensive. Um, other than that, yeah. Pretty, uh, pretty well on schedule through the year, and um, sure, looking good. Have we ordered a new pumper for the fire department? Uh, no, we were, it had the order hasn't been made yet on the truck. going to be a long wait, I would imagine. So once we have finalized pricing, that's when we'll come with the borrowing bylaw, have that set in place before we officially accept any tenders. So that, those will all kind of work in conjunction, but we don't want to do the bylaw and then have to revisit the numbers. Okay. Thank you. Next, 13.3. Foundational documents. Yeah, so same thing on that. As I'd mentioned in the uh, the previous ones, we were a little bit behind the eight ball coming out of uh, of Q1. Um, good catch up though. Next big ones that'll be coming up in front of council will be the uh, or, you know heavy read anyways. Uh, the parks master plan. Um, the manager there and I want to get that wrapped up and uh, and presented to council. Um, and then yeah, we'll just start uh, start bringing them forward as quickly as we can without uh, giving you guys 200 page agendas <laughs> every couple of weeks. We appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, can someone give us an update on the uh, highway signs? When, when can we expect? So I spoke to the contractor uh, just last week on that. We finally got approval from uh, Ministry of Highways late last week on the 
ish, I believe. Um, somewhere thereabouts, we've been waiting on that for, for some time. We had to move the signs because of some of the in you know underground utilities, and then that created spacing issues between the, the and now we had to lose from the highways. All that to say, it took a little bit of time. That's finally come in, um, and the signage company was waiting for that to actually start building them to make sure that we had approval and being able to alter the signs. Correspondence that they're starting to build them now, they're through now, and uh, same thing. Those will be installed once the construction season or uh, all the pieces are in place. We just got to get the signs built in. So, anyway, uh, they did give me a deadline. I was hoping to do it before the fair. Uh, I'll double check that. I'll send you guys the email. Yeah. Yeah. Be nice to have it done before the end of this term. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Seeing how it didn't get done before the end of the last term, <laughs> or the last term, yeah. Those will one. It just seems like that one. They just can't be. No, those uh, all the yeah. all the pieces are finally in place for that. So. Uh, uh, yeah. Yes. Well, I hope so. Yeah, those will be. Uh, those will be this summer without fail. Okay, so what do we get happening tomorrow? So tomorrow's our big. Um, Employee safety meeting, 6.30 a.m. start. 7.30? Why do I have 6.30? Oh, probably. Yeah, yeah. Hi, hey, yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> 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 you actually could be there at 6. So 6, yeah. <laughs> 6? 6 it is. So uh, there you go. Mitch has a, uh, a good PowerPoint, too, in fact, PowerPoint presentations to deliver to the staff. And uh, we're going to cook a bunch of pancakes and a whole bunch more sausages. So, Mitch is in charge? No, I'm just food. <laughs> the food is all there for you guys, and the aprons are all there for you. I'm not a cook at all. Oh. I well, can't cook. <coughs> yeah, I figured you could. Um, okay, so is there anybody that can't show up at 6 you want us there, correct? I guess so. I'm not sure who's letting us in, though. I have a key. So Councillor Barry should be there at six. He's he knows the drill pretty good. <laughs> the rest of us show up at five after. <laughs> we made it for what four hundred? How many was that our town meeting? Four hundred. This is easy. One quarter, twenty-five percent. Yeah. Okay. Well, it again. At least is nice. And will there be any uh, awards or anything handed out tomorrow? Is there any? Safety awards? No, because we push those off now. So, uh, no. Okay. Let's not talk about it. <laughs> Let's not go any <laughs> further. Whoa. Okay. Okay. Whatever. I just remember in the past, pre COVID, that we used to have safety awards. So. Okay. That's fine. I'm there to cook. Yeah. Excellent. So what else we got coming up? Uh, Mark Lucas' retirement party is on May the 10th. Barbecue. On the 8th is where, yeah, that you'll be here. Okay. And Victoria Day, we're going to be closed this year. Okay. That's the way she's going to run. And that's about it. Is there any other business of council? Then I would adjourn this meeting at 4.50. <laughs>